An abuse takes place on a number of scales. The self-harm, self-abuse, drug-related abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. There's abuse of power and all of those kinds of things. That was the state of the Arabs before Islam. And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time that he sent him to the place that he sent him to the people that he sent was because that was the greatest challenge, fa challenge faced by humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show that this Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isn't a magician. This isn't some trick that he's playing. This isn't fluke. This isn't a chance. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam isn't a politician who is very eloquent and very skillful with his words and he's able to convince the people around him and change the state of their people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved the greatest challenge for the greatest prophet. That was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. People steeped in ignorance on every level imaginable. So when we talk about abuse, these were people who were intoxicating themselves. Not just on a normal scale, these people were intoxicating themselves whilst they were going around the Kaaba. Imagine that. In the face of the, even though they knew this is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was built by the great prophets before them, they were individuals who were intoxicating themselves, drinking wine and drinking alcohol in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's house itself. Look at the state of today. I want to do a comparison. That was the state before. The state after of those people was that they stopped drinking totally. They would not allow, as we see, the likes of Sayyidina Ali Karamallahu Wajhahul Kareem, that when he's injured in war, that they say to him, Let us give us give you some intoxication to take away the pain whilst we remove the wound from you. He refuses. This is their state. That even in a state where medically it would be permissible to take it, they refused. Yeah. The state today of people, we see that haram drugs, drugs has the same ruling as alcohol. Yeah, the Sahaba Al-Kiram said that anything that loses your intellect or clouds your intellect is haram. It's the same as alcohol. That in this day and age, we're looking at this civilized country. You know, they like to classify countries. First world, second world, third world countries. They refer to certain countries as third world. By what standard? Not by the standard of good character, not by the standard of generosity, not by the standard of the crime rate or the percentage of crime rate. It's by economics. They look at how many people are so-called educated and financially stable. That's their standard. So in this first world country, more people die because of alcohol related deaths than all of the other prohibited drugs put together. Take cannabis, heroin, cocaine. And all of those put them together, the amount of people that die because of alcohol is more than all of those put together. And yet it's still allowed. Where's the civilization in that? Where's the intellectual reasoning in that? And it's this kind of backwardness that the Prophet ﷺ totally transformed. How did he transform it? By being the role model. Today, our brothers and sisters that are here today know that in many of the cities of England, it's our brothers who are running the drug circles. We're the suppliers, we're the ones that are doing it. What excuses do they make? Well, if we don't do it, somebody else will. Are the kuffar that we're supplying to anyway? What does it matter? A'udhu billah. We don't understand the impact that it has. You don't know how many people the likes of Imam Khalid have to deal with. How many weeping mothers we have to listen to. How many desperate wives whose lives have been destroyed because their husbands are on drugs, their children are on drugs. This is the damage that is wrought at the hands of Muslims today. Muslims, can you believe that? This is the challenge, brothers and sisters. You know what I'm talking about. You know individuals yourselves. But this is the jihad. Every single person is given skills. Every person is given a role. Every person is given a responsibility on this life. We have doctors here. We have dentists here. We have counselors here. 
We have housewives here. We have sisters who are in the medical field, in different kinds of aspects. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you an opportunity to serve His creation, not to destroy them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, أَحِبُّ الْعِبَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْفَعْهُمْ إِلَىٰ خَلْقِهِ أو كما قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. The most beloved of the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to him are those that are most beneficial to his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us as what? As representatives, as caretakers on this earth. Are we fulfilling that role as caretakers or are we destroying the very land and the people and the animals and the seas and the air that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us responsible for? What are we doing? Because the destruction that was taking place before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ is taking place again now. But the pitiful state is that it's now at the hands of the Muslims. Yes, there's much good in us. Alhamdulillah, we are the most charitable uh, group of people. Muslims give more charity than any other denomination. Yes, we are those that worship the most. Alhamdulillah, you know, the amount of people that you see in the masajid on a, on a Friday is probably more than the amount of Christians that gathered on the 25th of December for the birth of Jesus, as they say they're gathering for. <coughs> but this is an opportunity that we have of being trans positive, transformative agents in this world. And that was the Prophet ﷺ. Look at his statement. The Quraysh surround Abi Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. Yeah, that great individual who supported the Prophet ﷺ and defended him and protected him. And they came to him and they said, look, we'll make you an offer. Tell your nephew, we will give him women, we will give him wealth, we will give him position. Tell him to name what he wants, just tell him to stop proclaiming his religion. Abu Talib goes to the Prophet ﷺ, look, this is the offer Quraysh bring down. The Prophet ﷺ is said that if they were to put the sun in my right and the moon in my left, I would not stop. An la ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That is the dedication we need, brothers and sisters. What's he saying there? If they were to give me that which is impossible for them to give, never mind what's possible. If he was to say that if they were to fill my household with mountains of gold, yeah, hypothetically it was possible. But he was giving them a challenge. He's saying to them, there is nothing that you can do actually or even hypothetically that you can do which will stop me on this mission that's what we need today when we revive the message and the remembrance of the birth of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's what we want yeah we don't want to be like the people in jahiliya who made a token gesture claim of following their god they used to say allah and they used to worship idols at the same time it's just a claim there's no reality behind it we don't want to be token Muslims. We don't want to be pretend Muslims. We don't want to be plastic Muslims. That's not what we are. This life is very short. It's a blink of an eye. It will go. You don't want to go into that grave and you don't even recognize your Prophet You don't want to enter onto that day of judgment and the Prophet is not smiling at you this is your opportunity to win the smile of the Prophet ﷺ. This is your chance. And if we look and compare again, we see the likes of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an, when the Sahaba used to get together, they were talking about the days of Jahiliyyah. What, what were they doing? They were making idols out of stone. Things they were creating out of their own hands and then they were calling it their creator. It's, you wonder where does the intellect go? We're seeing that today. Maybe the idols are no longer in the form of a statue. But wealth has become our idol. Yeah. Television has become our idol. Yeah. Our positions have become our idols. We respect that and follow that more than we follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. We follow our desires more. Yeah. Our private parts demand something, we go and fulfill it. Our stomachs demand something, we go and fulfill it. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger are telling us to do that which is against it, we are following our own desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, have you seen the one who takes his desires as his Lord? Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word Lord in the Quran. Because the one whose orders you follow, that is your Lord. 
actions speak louder than words. The one that commands you and the one whose commands you follow is the true one that you obey. That is who your Lord is. And so when we look at the time of Jahiliyyah, another thing that we see amongst the, the Arabs of that time was that they would fulfill their desires, elicit inappropriate relationships with the opposite gender. Look at the damage that it has wrought in our day and age today. How many people are suffering from diseases because of it? How many households are damaged because of it? How many marriages have broken down? How many children are there today who don't even know who their father is? 50% of children in America come about through uh, relationships outside of marriage. They don't even know who their parents are. And people will say, well, you know, it's a, it's a free country. We can do what we wish. Yes, you can do what you wish, but not when it's make somebody else suffer for your desires. Those children deserve to have parents. Those children deserve to know who their parents are, to have a lineage, to know that when they're getting married, they're who they're getting married to. If you don't know who your father is, you don't know who you're getting married to in the future. You don't know who that child is. Could be related to you. And these are the days of Jahiliyyah that repeat themselves amongst us again. When we look at the Arabs before the time of the Prophet Sallallahu one of the reasons why they didn't follow the Prophet Sallallahu is that they used to say, this is not the religion of our forefathers. We follow our forefathers. Whatever they said, we're going to do. We will not oppose them. Today, culture has taken that place. Today, when Islam says something, it's passed to one side and culture is followed instead. When it comes to marriage rituals, especially, for example, when it comes to choosing a spouse, who rules? People say, well, this person is, you know, they're from England or they're from this caste or they're from this tribe or they're from this land. When did Islam ever say that? Yeah, brothers and sisters being denied getting married, some not getting married for five, ten years because they're waiting for their parents to allow them to marry who they want to. There's no other valid reason to stop that marriage apart from he's from the wrong caste, sorry. And this isn't a joke. Our sisters are marrying non-Muslims because of this. That's fact. This is the damage that it causes when we leave aside Islam and we follow the ways of our forefathers even if they were on error. What is culture? Islam is a religion that comes to every people of every color, of every language, in every land, in every time. And once you say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is no difference between black and white or blue and green. There is no difference between what language you speak or what country you are from. We see that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the Sahaba were digging the trench in the battle in Medina al Munawwara, the Muhajireen and the Ansar were debating with each other as to which side Sayyidina Salman al-Farsi is on. The Muhajireen were those that had migrated from Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. The Ansar were those who were already resident in Medina al Munawwara. And so the Muhajireen were saying about Sayyidina Salman al-Farsi that he's from us, he's a Muhajir because he came from the lands of Persia and he migrated here. And the Ansar was saying, no, he was already in Medina al Munawwara when the Prophet ﷺ came. The Prophet ﷺ sees this and comes out and he speaks to them and asks them, what are you debating about? It was jovial, there wasn't no harshness in it. They said that the Muhajireen are claiming Salman for them and the Ansar are claiming him for themselves. The Prophet ﷺ said, Salman minna ahl al bayt. He said, Salman is from my family, he's from my household. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't say, well, he's Persian. He's not an Arab. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say that. Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made him stand on top of the Kaaba. There is no declaration of the abolishment of racism greater than that in history. Again, so-called civilized world that we're in today, civilized country, how much racism takes place. Islamophobia and all of these kinds of things. The Prophet وسلم, look at him. Tell Sayyidina Bilal, who the people of that land used to consider a slave, made him stand on top of the Kaaba. Imagine that. 
What bigger declaration of the abolishment of racism do you want to see? And all of those kinds of issues, immigration, big issue today. When the Muhajireen migrated from Mecca to Al-Mukarramah to Medina to Al-Munawwara, look at the brotherhood that the Prophet ﷺ created and the sisterhood. They didn't complain. So-called educated, well-off, civilized individuals, oh, these Arabs are going to come and take our jobs. They're going to ruin our country. Where is the humanity? Where is it gone? These people are fleeing because their lands have been bombed, destroyed. Yeah. With chemical weapons that kill and maim for generations. <coughs> they don't just leave and destroy those that are there present today. They leave their uh, impact on generations afterwards as well. These people have fled that. And instead of opening arms, we've closed our borders. We've made them scapegoats. The Prophet ﷺ, when the Muhajireen migrated to Medina Tul Munawwara, look what the Prophet ﷺ did. He made ties of brotherhood between them. He specifically by name assigned, this migrator is your brother, you need to look after him. And the Sahaba open arms, some willing to sacrifice 50% of their business, giving it to their brother. Their house, giving it to their brother. No questions asked. He didn't say, excuse me, which clan are you from? Are we from the same village back home? Didn't ask that. No questions asked. The Prophet ﷺ made those brothers. What was their statement? And listen to this very carefully. The bond of brotherhood in La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is stronger than the bond of blood itself. It's stronger than the bond of a nation and a country itself. What are we going to say that our bond of brotherhood through blood is more important than our bond through La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah? Is our blood worth more than La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? Is our passport and our country and our nationality and the skin of our color and our language more important to us than La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? These are the kinds of barriers. We know that there's racism within our communities because we're living in the times of jahiliyyah. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ transformed in 23 years. One of the greatest miracles of the Prophet ﷺ.